Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast, a weekly show featuring B2B sales leaders and executives. Hosted by five-time CRO John McMahon and Force Management co-founder John Kaplan, the show goes behind the scenes with the people who have been there, done that, and seen the results. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe, rate, and review the show to help us reach more people. Revenue Builders is brought to you by Force Management. We help companies improve sales performance, executing the growth strategy at the point of sale. Find us at forcemanagement.com. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast. I'm John McMahon, and my special guest today is Kino Helmy. He's a five-time CRO, started his career at PTC, grew through the ranks to become an area VP at Opsware, which was acquired by HP. And at HP, Kino was the VP of global accounts for the 500 largest U.S. accounts. After HP, Kino became the CRO at Digby, and then moved on to be the CRO at Duetto. After Duetto, Kino became the CRO at Platform 9, and after Platform 9, the CRO at Pegasus. Today, we find Kino Helmy as the CRO at Espressive. Welcome, Kino Helmy, man. How are you? I'm doing good, John. Thanks. <laughs> it's good to see you. You too. Yeah. Well, Kino, let's start by you telling us a, a little bit about Espressive, this new startup that you're at, and what issues Espresso solves for customers. Yeah. So, John, uh, Espressive is one of the market leaders in the conversational AI for automated internal help desk space. Uh, probably the easiest way to think about it is like Alexa, but for the internal help desk with more of an emphasis on automations than just answering questions. So like Alexa can adjust your thermostat. You know, our application covers the majority of use cases that you would have to get in touch with the internal help desk for password resets, software provisioning, things of that nature. So we take bodies off of the help desk and we deliver a world class customer experiences because employees are able to get their questions and 80 percent of their IT related issues resolved in a fraction of the time it would take if you have to engage uh, a live help desk person. Okay, so give me give me a one quick example of that. So bring it to life. Um, I need I'm a new employee and I need to be added to an email distribution list. I'm a salesperson. I want to get all the emails from the sales function. That's something. Or I'm locked out of my Microsoft 365 account. I need access, and you would engage our virtual assistant exactly like you would speak to a human being and it would understand you and try to resolve whatever your issue was. So what am I speaking into my, into my computer or mobile device or am I typing it? And then I'm getting a, you know, an automated response. How, how yeah. am I, how am I interfacing with it? Yeah. Well, it is one of the few products on the market that is a true omni channel solution. So whatever channel and means that you would historically engage the help desk, which would be, email, phone, chat, Slack, Teams. We even have a mobile app. We would intercept the communication regardless of which channel it originated from and mm -hmm. would engage you in a conversational interaction uh, just like you were talking to a human being. Interesting. I got to believe that there's a lot of back-end analytics too to understand what are people mostly calling about, what are the biggest problems, things like that. Yeah, it's kind of a good lead into what we might be talking about today. The topic is that the first thing that we do when we've gained agreement that we're going to try to validate technology is we get a data dump from the customer's ITSM platform, whether that's ServiceNow or Avanti or ShareWell. And all that data that you just referenced is pretty well documented in that data dump. So we go into some kind of a validation event, understanding what constitutes 80% of the reason people are engaging the help desk in the first place. Interesting. Well, let's jump into that. You know, you have a lot of experience. You're a five-time CRO. You've done a lot of POCs, POVs, or in this case, you call it validation events. So 
choose your terminology, but let's first discuss what is a POV and then discuss when you should not do a POV and when you should do a POV. So give us some of your thoughts. Yeah. So uh, the the term POV, I've only really seen it kind of uh, being used in the last 10 years. You know, back in the day when you and I were at PTC, we used to use the term POC and the, the abbreviation stands for proof of concept. And what you're really striving to validate with a POC is that the technology works as advertised, right? right. But right. with the advent of more business centric discussions in technology the last 10 years or so the emphasis has been on not just validating technology but also validating business value so a pov which is uh the term that's in vogue these days the difference between it and a poc is you're not only validating that the tech works as advertising but you're validating the business case that's ultimately going to support the purchase if it goes forward. Right, exactly. So let's talk about when a rep should not do a POV. What would what are you some of your thoughts there? Well, my thoughts uh, back from when I was carrying the bag and all my contemporaries that that we were lazy. Not only were we lazy, but we had big numbers hanging over my, our heads and guys like you that weren't winning any awards for patients. Um, so, <laughs> Be, you nice know, Be nice now. Be nice. We didn't like to do them because our perception was it elongated the sales cycle um, and that it added a lot of friction to the sales cycle. But, uh, you know, a few battle scars and a little bit more gray hair and a lot of experience have taught me that you want to do a POV. You actually want to volunteer a POV for several reasons. First and foremost, it increases the predictability of the outcome. It improves your forecasting by an order of magnitude. If you set up a POV the right way, which we're going to talk about in a little bit here, um, your conversion rate should be north of 70% because the deal is done before you even start the POV because we're going to control and negotiate the circumstances under which we agree to do the POV. Second, well, then, then let me stop you there. So then why only 70%? Well, if you've agreed to the criteria, you have a strong champion. Mm hmm have aligned your differentiators to their pain points, then why would you only come out with 70% win a well, win rate? 70% would be a minimum. It really should be closer to nine, 90. Uh, and the Delta is what I put in the forecasting bucket that all of us get coverage for is the act of God proviso. If there's an acquisition that's announced, that could stop your deal dead in its tracks. If the economic buyer or your champion is terminated in the middle of the POC, that's something that's going to have a bearing on the outcome, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so that's really should be it, but it should be closer to 90. I was saying 70 to be really conservative. Okay, so let's go back to your first point about why you should do a POV is – you feel like it could be a competitive differentiation or competitive weapon against your competition because you feel like your your differentiator is perfectly aligned to the customer's pain points in that specific use case. Depending on the circumstances, you know, John, there, there are two fundamental sales motions, right? Sales motion A the customer doesn't know that they're sick. They don't know that something's wrong. You're showing fire to cavemen. You're trying to provoke them and put them into the market. There is no competition. The competition is do nothing, right? And then sales motion B, the customer is actively in the market for a solution. They've been doing research six months before any salesperson finds out about it. Um, they're going to buy something from someone. You don't need to convince them to buy something. They're going to buy something, and it just going to depends on which which company they end up buying for. So in sales motion A, you earn the right to predicate the POV on an investment in you. 
if I do this, if I meet the success criteria, you're going to buy this solution from me. In right. sales motion B, you don't have that right. All you can hold their feet to the fire is that they're going to commit to buy something from someone within a prescribed time period. And then the challenge begets making sure that the success, the success criteria is very heavily weighted towards you. Okay. But let's let's pick this thing apart a little bit. If I have, in your case, Espressive, I have a brand new technology that customers may not actually understand how to implement it, what the use cases really are, I can alleviate a lot of their concerns by doing a POV and proving to them what my product can do for them in their particular use case. Precisely. That okay. would be sales motion A. Okay. And then if I have a complex solution, something that really takes a long time, it's not easily demonstrated, but it's more demonstrated through, you know, maybe a multi-day POV because it's a complex problem. It requires a deeper understanding to showcase its value. In that case, I might want to do a POV. Sure. Um, if they don't know that they're sick, they need to see what well looks like. And that's exactly why you would do one. Right. OK. And if I am going to do one, which you had talked about earlier, I have to have met the EB in advance of the POB to qualify certain items. So when you meet the EB in advance of the POV, what do you recommend your salespeople qualify for? So. You know, our our experience categorically with EBs is that the animal looks really, really similar uh, across all functional areas, across all disciplines. He or she is very impatient. They tend to be very bottom line oriented, and they're trying to very quickly assess risk and return. So your talk track with the economic buyer has to meet that fundamental criteria. Uh, a statement about the business problem, uh, a statement about how we're going to eliminate or reduce the business problem, what the investment looks like, how we're going to go about proving that the investment will drive the return that the investment is predicated on. And then there may be some ancillary stuff that improves your chances of winning the deal and potentially growing the deal like his or her vision beyond the initial scope of the deployment or how this might elevate an agenda that you think they might be interested in. When we're talking to CFOs, we're talking about ROIs. When we're talking about COOs or even CEOs, we're talking about driving shareholder value. So you want to use the vernacular uh, for whatever the deliverable of the POC is going to do in a language that they understand and that 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 gives them an additional incentive to get vested in the POC. Whereas initially, the only reason they may be having that conversation is because this is something that their team wants to do, but it, it'll probably be for more tactical reasons. So those are the reasons that you want to meet with the EB. Increase the predictability of the deal, potentially grow the business value of the deal, and set the table for expansion uh, down the road, since most POCs for the initial deal are a land and expand motion. Yeah. And in that meeting, are you qualifying for budget and timing and key stakeholders that should be involved or should not be involved in the POV? Those are table stakes. Yeah. That is the central purpose that we as salespeople want to meet with the EOB. That's a minimum, that you're going to buy something within a prescribed time period and that there is budget and that we can discuss any gotchas or jack-in-the-boxes that may appear at the last moment, like it's got to obviously uh, pass the security review or there's a compliance person if there's any kind of personal data that's going to be shared during the POC. That's what the purpose is, to identify any and all parties whose votes that we have to get, make sure that the dollars are there and make sure that they're prepared to ensure, prepared to ensure that the purchase um, occurs within the specified period of time. Yeah. And I also want to go back on something you said about the EB's vision, especially these days, because we're doing a lot of land and expand. So you really need to understand what their vision is for this product if 
they do buy. Yeah, I'll gi- I'll give you an example of a deal that we um, that we recently did where we were end up able to actually triple the size of the deal because we followed this playbook. Um, the name of the company is DXC. Uh, they used to be called EDS before HP acquired them and then spun them off. So they are in the business of selling outsourced help desk to the Fortune 500. So if you're a, a, an employee of Pfizer, when you call the help desk, you're not actually talking to a Pfizer employee. You're talking to a DXC employee. DXC wanted a we eat our own dog food narrative, right? So not only are we selling the this in our go-to-market stuff, but it's something that we actually use internally. So we started with the CIO who was not really excited about having this shoved down um, their throat, right? So she did a deal with us begrudgingly. But after we um, started showing some results uh, and, and having some conversations with her, she started talking about a vision where Instead of having to go to 12 different chat bots for the different functional areas, oh, my paycheck's messed up. I got to engage the payroll chat bot. Oh, I need a PO cut. I need to get to the supply chain chat bot. She had a vision where she wanted one place to go, regardless of what her issue or what the employee's issue was. That became the basis for the POC. Instead of just validating the IT technology like the business was asking her to do, we did a POC that enabled her to see the manifestation of her vision. And in doing so, we tripled the size of the deal. Yeah, that's really good. So that's another reason why you might want to do a POB. I mean, you can create a pretty large ROI um, during the POV that's based upon some of the preliminary ROI, you know, calculations that you have. And then inside the the POV, you can really bring those to life and maybe to your point, generate a much larger deal. Yeah. I hear us talking, John, and, and it sounds like we're trying to make a case to the reps of the world on why they want to do a POC or a POV. Well, um, we can get to the reasons why they <laughs> why they won't want to do one. We'll do that next. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you're you're spot on. Yeah. Okay. And I think the other thing when you meet with if done right, you have a you have a champion, you get to the economic buyer, you've outlined the decision criteria. One of the things that you know I want to highlight that you touched on was it should be a prelude to an order, meaning that the POV results should bring the sales process to a natural close, right? Because there is no other reason to do a POV if you don't think that you're going to be successful and it's going to bring the process to a natural close where you're going to go and get a deal. Well, what you think as a rep or what your aspirations don't mean anything. All that matters is what you're able to get the EB to commit to. And if they're not able or willing to commit to that, then it's either premature or you're setting yourself up for a very risky, you're betting on the come. And uh, that's not, that's not good sales hygiene. So my guidance in that scenario, in the absence of getting that commitment from the EB on the timeframe and the price point is to take your ball and go home until they're ready. Yeah, right. Because sometimes it's just not a priority for the business. If you ask the EB, where does this rank in your in your priority list? Sometimes they may say it's not really a high priority for me. It's not something I want to spend money on right now. OK, time, as you said, to go home and you know take your ball and go home. Exactly. I would rather know that going up front and not participate in the POV than to tie up the company's time, effort and resources, because it's not an insignificant undertaking, especially if you're going to you're going to do it right. Yeah. So let's this may sound like the flip side, but there's some other elements here. Let's talk about why you should not do a POV. And one of the first things that I see is a lot of times reps want to do a POV very early in the sales process. Yeah, they are trying in that instance, John, 
to try to use the POV as a basis for putting the customer in the market, which I would argue is a terrible use of uh, of time and resources. Like I said, they're not insignificant undertakings, and there are much more cost effective and timely um, ways to to accomplish that. A POV is not a reason that you, you don't use a POV to try to put the customer in the market. Yeah, the other times I've seen this is because they're trying to do it too early in the sales process. They don't have a thorough understanding of the customer use case. I don't know if you've seen that also. Many, many, many times, right? It's a uh, it's a term that gets batted around at the water cooler, and you know, especially younger in your career, you're more inclined to do that because you're confusing activity with qualified accomplishment, right? If I'm doing these things, if I'm busy. You know, Jeff's doing a POV, you know, Stacy's doing a POV. I should be doing the POVs. And then, you know, my management will see how busy and engaged I am. But uh, uh, it's a very risky proposition for no return when you do it early in the sales cycle and you haven't qualified the opportunity yet. Right. And when they do it early in the sales process and they don't understand the customer use case, there's no way that they actually have clear POC criteria. They haven't locked or POV criteria. They haven't locked it down. And that's when you really get into trouble because you're basically going in blind to a, to a POV without understanding what the rules of the game are. You're throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and you're hoping something sticks and that's not good sales hygiene. Yeah. The other ones in, you know, that, that you and I have seen is, you know, they don't have a champion. They, they, they want to believe that they have a champion, but they have a coach. And when they don't have a champion, they typically never get to the economic buyer, but you'll still see some salespeople rush head on into a POC, POV. Yeah. Uh, you know, I did a little bit of time, as you were mentioning at HP software and uh, getting to the EB was not that difficult because these accounts would be doing 100 200 million dollar books of business with HB we could get an audience with the EB but what happens when you get an audience with the EB and you haven't had the champion take you there is the EB nods and smiles cuz he's doing a lot of business with your company and he says um that all sounds wonderful but i need skippy jack to tell me that. So you've just added an extra step to your sales process. The criticality of having a champion take you to the EB is if you if you recall the four criteria that a person has to meet in order to be an EB, at least in Kino Helmi's vernacular, they must be in the power base, they must have access to the economic buyer, they must have a selfish invested interest for backing you and you alone. And then the last one is they have a willingness to take you to the economic buyer. All of those four, the number one thing that matters that allows you to assume the other three is that the champion takes you to the economic buyer. That is the moment at which the phoenix rises from the ashes. That is the moment at which that person has earned the right to be called a champion and not a prospective champion. You know, when we're doing our forecast reviews, John, and just talking about deals in general, this is about the only thing that I'm nutty about. And everybody on my team will know that. You want to call that person a prospective champion? You do it all day long. But until that person takes you to the economic buyer, you do not have the right to call that person a champion. I mean, it's only the most important aspect of the sales process. I have seen POCs go terrible. But what we had is a champion that was defending us that still allowed us to get to a deal. You could have no champion, knock the cover off the ball in the POC, and you ain't getting a deal. Or you could have a champion and have a terrible POC and still get the deal. Of, of all the pillars of Medic, it's the only one that is non-negotiable. Right. You can win deals without good metrics. You can win deals without really understanding the decision process. But you cannot, under any circumstances, win a deal 
without a champion. And I know not we're not here today to talk about champions, but in the context of POCs, I emphasize having the champion take you to the economic buyer, even if you can get to the economic buyer some other way. Right. The other reason, and I agree with everything that you said, I want to add one other reason why you have to have a champion. We need champions for all the reasons that you stated as salespeople to get to the economic buyer. But the economic buyer needs a champion that they can hold accountable for a successful implementation of the product. They're not going to just buy a product and hope that somebody in the organization is going to start to implement it successfully. They need to hold somebody accountable. That is exactly why it's critical critical for him or her to take you to the economic buyer. What they are saying subtly in doing so is I'm signing up to deliver on that project. I'm the one putting my neck on the line to make sure that these are the guys that I want to dance with. Yeah. Yeah. So basically I'm hearing, you know, I used to call the economic buyer meeting, the go, no go meeting, you know, in the sales process. It was only one step. There was nothing, nothing else there. You either met the economic buyer or you did not meet the economic buyer. It was either successful meeting or it was not successful meeting. You know, it was black or white. That's it. And it sounds like you're pretty much the same in your sales process. I am spot on with one caveat. It's great that you go have the meeting with them. But especially younger reps, this is a good message to all you younger reps out there. That's half the battle, getting to the EB. When you actually get there, you do not leave that meeting until he or she has committed they're going to move forward. At a minimum, they're going to buy something from someone within that time period, if it's a competitive POC. But if it's just you or do nothing, do not leave that room until he or she is committed They will buy if you meet the success criteria. They know about how much it's going to cost. You've given them a preliminary proposal. You've given them a preliminary ROI and that they've committed that the purchase will occur within a specified time frame. That's the only way you're going to be able to forecast this thing with any level of, uh, of, of accuracy. Yeah. So let's try to wrap this into like a bow by talking about what a rep should do if they are going to do a POV, what they should do before the POV, during the POV, and after the POV. So let's start with what they should know and what they should be prepared for before the POV. So ideally, you would have gotten some coaching from your champion, um, you know, about what the person is like, the EB, right? Just, you know, for some basic rapport building. Are they a Red Sox fan? You know, did they go to Notre Dame or whatnot? So you can start with a little bit of rapport building. Then you should walk your champion through what you plan on covering with the EO, with the EB and make sure that he or she has sanctioned the flow of the of the meeting and what you plan to cover. At a minimum, the EB is going to want to know why we're doing this. They're going to want to know how much it's going to cost, and they're going to want to know how to make their money back, and then what assurances they're going to get that the implementation is going to be successful, right? That is, at a minimum, what you need to be prepared for. Uh, That's basically on- the three whys. You know, why do, why do they have to buy? Why do they have to buy? from you and why do they have to buy now and if you're not prepared to really answer those questions succinctly you're probably not going to have a good meeting that's table stakes uh yeah. above and beyond that you'd love to know you know a little bit about this person's ascent through the organization does this person looks like they're looking for bigger and better things and you to the extent that you can help use your technology to cultivate a platform that addresses their broader vision. That's how you set the table for a better negotiation and ultimately for some additional expansion, as in the case of the CIO with DXC that we that we referenced. She had a vision that we were able to map to that enabled us to triple the size of our deal. That would be bonus points. That's if you're looking to get a bigger deal. That's if you're looking to ensure that the the software will proliferate. But why do anything 
Why do anything now and why do anything with me are the minimum criteria that you need to be prepared to succinctly answer before you have the EB meeting. Okay. So now you're getting ready. One of your reps is getting ready to do a POB. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, basic table stakes, like you said, is we have to understand the customer needs, you know, their pain points, their challenges, specific goals of the POV, you know, to their unique requirements. What else are you do you want to see from your salespeople before they do the POV? We talked about the EB meeting, but now we're preparing to actually do the POV. Yeah. So first thing we got to do is settle on the test plan. And by the test plan, I mean, what specifically are we going to be evaluating uh, during the scope? of the POV. This is where younger reps will get batted around like cat in a ball, a ball of yarn sometimes. That here comes these people into the POV and then all of a sudden, I want to see it do this, make it do that. And now you started with a scope like this and you're out of control and it's grown like that. You're no longer controlling what the purpose of the agreed, the agreed to purpose of the POV was in the first place. This is our thesis. This is how we're going to prove our thesis. This is specifically what we're going to test. So you got to get the test plan first and foremost, and you got to stipulate up front in the kickoff meeting, hey, Phil, Joe, Tina, over the next three days, this is what we're going to be measuring. We're not going to be measuring anything else. If you want us to measure other things, we can talk about that after the POC, POV. But for the next three days, this is all that we're going to be evaluating. Second, you got to make sure that the team that's going to be delivering on the POC understands what they're signing up for. The easiest way to piss off and alienate your sales engineer is to throw them into the fire where they don't understand what the mission is and they're not prepared to deliver on the mission. The POC and the deal should be one before you even land on site. And the way that we know that is because we've agreed on the scope, we've gotten commitment from our team that they can deliver on the scope, or if they're they're nervous about it, we reset expectations, modify the scope. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the environment that we're going to be landing in in order to execute on the POC has all the blocking and tackling addressed. Firewall ports have been set up. The people on their side have been assigned and designated. We know what we're going to be doing with each one of those people. And all of that should be codified in the POC plan or the test plan, which we will deliver to the customer in advance of starting the POC, which makes sure that we're on the same page. Love it. So let me just try to like summarize some of that. First, we have to define like the objectives for the POV, which could include, you know, metrics like increased efficiency, cost savings, improved performance, you know, enhanced user experience. But then we have to do is we have to set clear success metrics. Like what does success look like? You know, so what are those indicators that we're going to find in the POV that's going to determine the fact that we are successful or not successful in meeting the test criteria? That's okay? exactly and then, right. And then... Like you said, to make sure that all parties that are involved are aware of the plan and they're aware of their roles, you know, that they're going to play on our side as the vendor and on their side as the customer. That's right. Now, the other thing that I've seen, though, um, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Kino, is you also have to define in that plan that the same customer representatives see all the competitors. You know, you can't have like one group of the customer sees vendor A and another group sees vendor B and another group sees vendor C. And then they try to discuss, you know, what they all saw when they all didn't see all three vendors participate. So I've seen it where you have to make sure that the customer has the same representatives from their side see all of the competitors. Uh, absolutely, John. And that should be covered in the EB 
meeting. That is going to be your opportunity to let's, for lack of a better word, let's say enforce the rules of the game. Uh, and if that, if we don't know in advance that that is not going to be the case, then it stands to reason that you would want to ask the EB about that very scenario. So you got these two guys that are going to evaluate this vendor. And then you got these two guys that are going to evaluate us. How are you going to reconcile the different perceptions, the different success criteria, the different experiences and the different scoring mechanisms? How's that going to be reconciled? And if the answer to that is, well, we're going to have a discussion about it. We see, you know, who like, then it's a beauty contest. Right. <laughs> that doesn't work. You're, yeah. you're taking on an inordinate amount of risk. And the only exception that I would make to that is if your champion is in the power base and is holding all the cards, uh, that would probably be the one ex exception that I would be willing to, to play under those circumstances. But I think the illusion, John, that these evaluations have for sales reps, I think the illusion is that it's a fair fight. That this right. is be, um, <laughs> an effective and objective evaluation. It yes. took me a good two years into my career to realize there is no such thing as objectivity. It does not exist. And the likelihood that a POC has been sanctioned already is very similar to an RFP hit in the streets that you didn't write and you didn't know about, right? The deal is done. This is just an exercise in futility that we're going through to justify a decision that was already made. So if I walked into a scenario where that was the case, where different people are going to be evaluating different technologies, I would assume the same thing as getting an RFP out of the blue. This deal is done. And unless I'm the guy that suggested that that's the way that it goes down and this deal was done at my champion, it's the only way I would participate in that. Yeah. And it's also that all vendors have to participate in the same time frame. Like if, if you say it's two days for the POV, it has to be two days for every vendor. There can't be any excuses and the same criteria like you talked about. And another trick that I've seen is sometimes I've seen it where we've specified that two application engineers work the POV. And then you find out that the competitor had three or four application engineers work in the same criteria. Well, that's just not a fair fight. There is no you have to make sure that you outline all these things in the plan. Otherwise you can get beat up. You can, because you're kidding yourself. If you think your competition is going to play fair and play by the rules, right? Those are simple guidelines to be ignored by good salespeople. This is war. You Shank, you bite, you gouge eyes, whatever it takes to win the business. We don't care about, we don't care about uh, fairness. We care about winning. We care about winning deals. So the best way that you can do this is to ensure that your test plan is going to be the scoring mechanisms by which all vendors are evaluated. That's why you also want to be the first person that gets to the EB and the first person to develop a champion. Because when factions rise, once this thing becomes sanctioned, once it's going to be a full on evaluation, that's when the jack in the boxes start. And the reason I say the deal is done before it even starts is because we know that the criteria that is going to be used for evaluation and the test plan and the scoring mechanism were produced by us. And spoiler alert, it's very heavily slated towards our strengths. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Right. And I want to go touch on something that, um, you know, you had a lot of lessons learned on also is scoring because a lot of times you have to watch how the vent, the customer is going to score each and every one of the different capabilities. Because sometimes they may, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being best, they may give you a 10 on a certain capability. But then what they do is they add a weighting. And then that's one of your major competitive differentiators. And they may weight it as a one. So then it comes out as a, as a one. 
And, you know, you just can't win that fight. So the scoring has to be agreed to before the POV also by all vendors and in writing. Otherwise, you can get you can lose just on the scoring and the waiting. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, John. I would take it a step further. And I tell you, you know, one of the, the best sales lessons I got in my life was in my very first job. Uh, it was a guy named Bill Granberry. Uh, Bill didn't go to college. And to this day, uh, he didn't work at any place like PTC. Still one of the best sales guys I've ever known in my entire life. And um, he, he didn't call me Kino. He used to call me Kay. And this was in Alabama, if you remember, when I started my PTC journey. Uh, I made some calls down there with you there in Mississippi, I remember. Awfully hard to sell software to companies that aren't using uh, computers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he used to tell me, hey, Kay, you want to be easy to do business with. You want to be easy to do business with. So let me tell you what engineers, architects, uh, service management folks, cloud people. Let me tell you what they aren't and what they don't want to be. They aren't professional software evaluators and they don't want to spend any time, effort or resources becoming professional so software evaluators. So do the work for them. Produce the scoring mechanism for them. Produce the weighting for them. Um, one really slick thing that we do uh, in our sales process, uh, you know, some people call it a lockout document, is once we've convinced them to move forward and sanction an evaluation, then somewhere along the way, someone says, well, we're going to have to do an RFP or we're going to have to put together, you know, this test plan. So what when they say RFP, we say, well, I can help you a little bit. What we've done is we've taken every RFP that we've participated in and we've codified them in a master database, a master deliverable. There's probably stuff in here that you hadn't even thought to evaluate that might benefit you. So I'm going to take the customer's name off of it and I'm going to provide it to you. And then you can just kind of pick and choose. Well, you know what happens nine times out of 10? <laughs> they use the exact deliverable. The they don't make any changes. They just set it out. Yeah, well, the, the change they make is they put their company logo. Yeah, all the boilerplate stuff. Yes. Yeah. They take the bait every single time. And the reason is they don't want to put together those deliverables. The deal is done. The minute we get them to agree to use our RFP, our scoring mechanism, the deal is done. And it and the waiting is already slated towards us, John. You know, it is it is rare that you're going to walk into a place that is gone through that trouble of their own volition and that it is the legitimate and objective evaluation with an RFP or a scoring template that they put together. Ninety nine times out of 100 that has been produced for them by uh, your competitor if it isn't come from you. 100 percent. 100 percent. That's why I said if you do it, if you do it right for all the reasons that we said and all the elements that you have to have in place, then it's essentially a prelude to an order. It brings the sales process to a natural close. You know, two other things that I think people need to do. Um, well, certainly one big one be before the POV is make sure that you run this whole thing, you know, test plan by your application engineer. Make sure that they're OK with it, you know. And then the other thing is, you know, develop if you're going to develop a test plan, develop a scenario that really highlights your differentiators and makes it easier for you to quantify the value of your solution and be able to put it into an ROI later. Spot on. Let's talk about. You're now in the POV. Mm hmm. There's a couple things that I think are, you know, best practices there. What have, what have you seen while you're in the POV? So uh, it is very rare that they go off without a hitch, right? So let's talk about um, what not to do and what to do during the POV. Here's what the rep does not get the luxury of. 
you don't get to kick off the POV and then hightail it out of there and start, you know, you're working other deals or whatnot. That it's silly to go into all that trouble to set up the POV, to meet with the EB, and then to just bail. Okay. So point number one, sales rep must be involved soup to nuts during the POV. Don't run the marathon and then quit at the very last mile. That's well, it's also like you said, because something can go wrong and you can't count on your application engineer to be able to handle it. It's, it's not their account. It's your account and you have to take ownership of it. You got to take ownership of it and you got to buy them air cover. So when something goes wrong in the POV, you start singing and dancing. You say, we're going to take a little break here and I'm going to go around, get everybody some coffee and donuts while we're, um, you know, while we're checking on, on something to make sure that we can complete the POC. Don't let them know that something has gone wrong that we can't that we can't handle. So have a contingency plan. Also, during the POC, you start getting extra credit. So something's going really well. Go grab Phil that may have stepped out into the hallway. Phil, I got to show you something. You got to go check this out. Make sure that the people that are in the power base that are involved in the POC get to see when you're knocking the cover off the ball. Also, at the end of the POV, we're going to produce this deliverable. I'm going to call it the champion's deck, right? That's basically going to uh, recap what we did during the POV and the results and the metrics. But to really knock the cover off the ball, it needs to be supplemented with extra credit type stuff. We like to document quotes from the participants of the POV. So if I hear Mark say, wow, that would have taken us two months to do what you just did. I'm gonna capture that in big quotations and I'm gonna put it on the slides in the POV. I've never seen an application that was able to do that. Get that quote. I can't believe that you wrote an integration in 10 minutes. These are extra credit stuff that's going to enable you to be in a much stronger position when you actually go into the negotiation. Because yeah, point, even, screen, even screenshots that really show what your product can do and highlight some of that. Right? Yeah. But the key is that's it's another reason why the salesperson can't leave. You need to be constantly measuring performance against the defined metrics because you're trying to quantify value and you're trying to highlight, as you pointed out, extra credits items. That's right. You got to There is a negotiation that's going on during the sales process. You uh, during the the POV, you are negotiating the score that's gonna that it's gonna go down by either challenging how long it would have taken them to do with a different vendor or in their current environment and arguing why the score should be higher, which again plays into the negotiation that's going to follow a successful POV. I think the other thing, uh, Kino, that I've seen during the uh, POV and why the sales people have to be there also is because you have the potential to build new champions. And typically your application engineers can help build some technical champions. But there's there may be some business champions that are in the room constantly for the whole entire POV. But what I've also seen is there's a lot of business people that come and check on the POV. They may not be involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, but they come walking in the room and they may spend a half an hour. That's an opportunity to get to know that person and potentially build another business champion. Yeah, so that's the two things that, that we should talk about there, John. So there's the people that are gonna show up serendipitously because they've heard that this is going on. You absolutely need a plan to maximize their value whether it's in understanding how they fit into the place if uh, if you didn't know that they were going showing up. But then on top of that, there's opportunities to bring people into the fold proactively that didn't even know it's going on, but that you've learned through the course of the deal or through the course of the POV, someone that would be material in greasing the skids. An example, our application while our biggest consumer is IT because they have the biggest help desk. 
Well, the company or the organization that has the second biggest help desk internally is the HR organization, right? How do I roll over my 401k? How do I add a dependent to my health plan? How do I switch health plan? These are typical questions that come into the HR service desk, right? So if we've started an IT POV, I will actively have our reps go find out Who's the CHRO? Who leads the HR function? Let them know what we're doing. Bring them into the POV and say, now watch, we just showed you know, them how to reset a password using our application. Now watch this. How many times do people call you asking you know, how to switch their health plans over? And then we'll just fire that up because it's one of our out-of-the-box capabilities. Now we've gotten somebody else excited they're an opportunity. To, they have an opportunity to influence the deal by telling the CIO, hey, we could use this in HR as well. And we potentially double the size of our deal and we put separation between us and the bad guys. As an example. No, it's a great idea. I love that. OK, let's move to after the POV. We just finished the POV. And one of the things that you brought up. You know, as during the POV, we need to constantly monitor and capture metrics and extra credit. And what you're going to build, I think you called it, it was a champion's deck. So at the end of the POV, you need to compile the results, the insights, the outcomes into a comprehensive report or presentation and doing the work, as you said before, previously, for your champion. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So the elements of what I'm calling the champion's deck, we can also call it a POV summary deliverable. It's basically the same thing, right? It recaps what we did during the POV and the technical results and then the the, the financial results, right? When we start a POV, all we have is a preliminary ROI. That is an ROI that is based on a set of assumptions that if you performed similar to companies that are in your cohort that happen to be customers of ours, this is what you can expect. But every company thinks that they're a unicorn. Everybody thinks, oh, no, the way we reset Pat worked here at XYZ Company is very different, right? They all think that. So we start with a preliminary ROI. During the POV, we go through their specific use cases and we hold a stop clock to it. So one of the deliverables that comes out of the POV is a vetted or a validated business case, which is hopefully going to be even better than the conservative preliminary ROI that you started with. So we start with the technical results with a current state and to be state for each one of the key use cases. Let's say password resets. Today, password resets requires 12 minutes and two touches. They're not going to dispute that. And then we're going to say, Ivan saw us do it in one touch and three minutes. So on the left-hand side of the business case, We extrapolate the number of employees times the number of password resets and what the labor value associated with that use case. And then we compare and contrast it on the right hand side. So today, password resets cost you a million dollars a year in labor. I just took it down to two hundred thousand dollars in labor. That's what's the first use case. We do that for each and every one of the use cases. So at the end, in the summary, total labor costs associated with the way you're doing things today is 12 million. Under me, it's going to be 4 million. So you owe me at least 3 million and you're still saving 50%, Mr. Customer. So technical results, financial results, vetted business case, and then you want to supplement it with the things that are going to start ticking up in the customer's head beyond the financial results, the implementation plan. How long is it going to take me to get there? Who's going to be involved? That's your opportunity to jam that in. So you have taken off the table all the questions that they're going to have before they're ready to move forward with the investment. Excellent. And what you need to do with with this deck and everything that you just outlined is the first person you have to debrief that with is your champion after the POV. And then to your point, because 
your ROI is materially different than the preliminary ROI that you originally had shared with the EB and the champion. You need to debrief with your champion and get back in front of the EB to show the material difference in the final justification in order to grow a much bigger deal. Yep. I want to talk about that for just a second, uh, John, uh, the last point that you raised about the ROI. But um, before we even talk about that, much in the same way that setting up the POV correctly ensures that you're going to win the deal before the POV even begins, it's the same for the wrap-up meeting with the EB. You don't go into that thing blind. You do a, a trial run with your champion. You show them what you're planning on cover because the EB is going to expect the champion or the evaluation team to say, Yes, we saw that. Those numbers are right. They're accurately, they're accurate. We went, we went, that has to happen before you have the final meeting with the EB to present the results. That's first thing. Second, sure. when it comes to the ROI, it's a little bit tricky. There's a needle that we're trying to thread, right? If we put down in the final deliverable, the actual ROI that they know we can achieve based on the results, guess what the EB is going to hold them accountable <laughs> yeah. to, right? Yeah, you just right. I just heard that you're going to be able to reduce staff by 80%. Show me the 80 bodies that are going away out yeah. of the 100, right? Mm -hmm. Well, naturally, your champion and that team is going to be reluctant to sign up for an ROI that high, even though they know that the ROI is, is accurate. So... The ROI has to be has to be negotiated with your champion, the evaluation team. And here's the needle that we've got to thread. It's That's got such to a good point. I've always said that you don't want to look like you're on a lunatic fringe. So even if you have a one thousand nine hundred percent increase in productivity or whatever it might be, you don't need that in order to justify the purchase that you want. So you have to back it down and give your champion, as you described, some cover for when they do the implementation, they're going to get the results that far exceed the ROI that you showed the economic buyer. Which will galvanize their resolve going into the EB meeting. But that's the needle that we've got to thread. It's got to be Big enough to defend the purchase, but low enough that they don't feel like they've got a target on their back and they're going to be held to preposterous standards. Yeah. Such a great point. Such a great point. Anything else you want to add on the post POV items that salespeople need to take care of? Plain and simple. If you're going to do them, do them right. If you're not going to do it right, don't do them. You're, it's a it's a quick path to getting terminated. You can only forecast accurately if you're going to set it up the right way. If you're going to half-ass your uh, your your POC, it's not going to go well. The likelihood of getting to that ninety percent closure ratio, you're going to cut that by two thirds, and uh, it's just a matter of time before it ca catches up with you and you're terminated for wasting the company's time effort and resources. For us, the EB meeting is a gating factor. I will not sanction a POV unless that EB meeting has taken place. And boy, let me tell you, I've seen many a rep squirm, John, because they're hearing all the right things from Larry Low Level, Marvin the Minion, <laughs> right? They're hearing all the right things and say, man, this, this is going to go great. I know he'll buy it if we do these things. I just know it. <laughs> they don't want to have the tough conversation, but I would I would argue that's your job, man. That's yeah. the that's the ante to play. So become comfortable having uncomfortable conversation is my parting words of uh, of wisdom. Yes. And for people that are listening, Kino Helmy has lots of scars of experience. So the words that he's generating right now are all based upon some really <laughs> tough lessons learned, not only for you. I've been there, too, my friend. So I go I'm in the same category. So I'm hoping that, you know, people that have don't have a lot of experience in POVs really heed the advice that you gave everybody during this session. So thank you so much, Kino. It really was fantastic.
fantastic session. It's always good to see you, John. And thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Kino Helmy. And thanks for everyone for listening to another episode of the Revenue Builders podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to check us out at forcemanagement.com. 